Welcome to the Association 100 podcast. The A100 podcast is an extension of our Association 100 bi-monthly newsletter that focuses on best practices, top trends, helpful ideas, and smart strategies and tactics that work in the world of associations. The podcast will feature meaningful conversations with association professionals across the country, taking a deeper dive into trending topics, offering insights that both inform and inspire. Welcome back to our latest episode of the Association 100 podcast. I'm Colin Gallagher, and I'm joined by my co-host, Megan Henning. Today, we're talking about the unicorn that is earned media and what association comms professionals need to know to improve their efforts on that front. We're so excited to welcome our guest today, Suzanne Struglinski. Suzanne is a PR manager for Industry Dive and highly regarded for her expertise around media pitching and outreach. Suzanne, thanks so much for joining us today. Hi, thanks so much for having me. This is going to be a great conversation. Yeah, absolutely. We're really excited to have you. So for our listeners, I had the good fortune of getting to know Suzanne through our roles on the Washington Women in PR Board of Directors. And she works for a really cool kind of up and coming organization called Industry Dive. So tell our audience a little bit more about you as a person and then also about Industry Dive and your role there. So yes, thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm the PR manager at Industry Dive and Industry Dive is a business journalism company that has 28 publications that go to carefully curated audiences of industry leaders. So we have very captive audiences across all of the industries we cover that have come to trust and depend on our coverage to give them the insight that they need that they're not going to find in other publications really tailored to the industries that they work in. So for example, Food Dive focuses on the food industry. Uh, Grocery Dive focuses on the grocery store industry. Uh, We just launched a new publication convenience store, uh, covering convenience stores called Sea Store Dive. Um, At first I was like, what what is about convenience stores? But when you think about uh, the shift to electric vehicles, the uh, regulations on tobacco products or the lottery or uh, supply chain issues. There's actually a lot of news in the C-Store industry and I'm very interested to watch what our team covers. So I have a really unique role of doing PR on media. Um, I do corporate comms for the overall, for Industry Dive, the overall corporation, as well as help my teams across the 28 publications get attention to the work that they are covering. So I work alongside about 120 reporters to get make sure people know about their work, what uh, investigations we're doing, what stories we're breaking, and making sure those stories are getting in front of the right audience. A bonus to working alongside reporters is really getting an inside track on the pitches they receive and the volume of pitches they receive and what really rises to the top of their inboxes and how the pitching process usually works. On top of that, just as my background, I was a a reporter for about eight years. I have a journalism degree. I went to Mizzou. I covered Congress and political campaigns. And I've also worked uh, for the National Resources Defense Council and the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. So I have that uh, kind of industry or, you know, association or, you know, coming to different news topics from a certain position or standpoint and how to serve as a resource for reporters. This is awesome. You are like a brain trust um, for all of the comms um, employees and professionals, I think, that are out there in our association. And that's a lot of who our audience is. So I'd love to ask you to start with what is often the disconnect between association leaders, what they see as news, and what your reporters see as news. And you mentioned that. Um, It would be great to hear what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, First off, comms people um, don't have an easy job. So for all of our (laughs) association PR folks here, I I know exactly the challenges that you're facing. If there's one thing we all take away from this discussion today is that one, reporters want news. And I'm going to say that again, reporters want news news. And I want to empower you to understand the differences sometimes between what reporters view as news, what you as the communications professional knows is news, and what industry leaders or other higher ups in your organization, members or volunteers or other people outside of the media industry thinks is news. Sometimes these things align, 
oftentimes they don't. And that's where the challenge comes in. A lot of times reporters are looking for trend stories. Uh, they are looking for information that no one else has. They are looking at what is going on in the particular industry they cover for, for my reporters, for other, you know, reporters at larger publications that have wider beats or, you know, covering national politics or national education policies or whatever their beat may be. The coverage that they have is going to is, is never going to be exactly what you want it to be. Keep in mind that no reporter is sitting at their desk hitting refresh on their email, waiting for a magical <laughs> press release to come through to guarantee their coverage the next day. That, that is not, that is not happening. You mean they're not just waiting for my news? No, my they're not. I, it's sad, you know? <laughs> no reporter is sitting at their desk waiting for that one email to come through or that magical press release, giving them the news for the next day. That That is not how it works. Now, have press releases helped coverage? Has, has someone worked to get their association named or a story, quote unquote, placed? Of course, that happens. I'm not going to say it never happens. But for the bulk of time, in my experience as a reporter and working with my newsroom colleagues, uh, we, you are not just one email away from getting that story. Um, it's actually quite the opposite. Um, instead, reporters' inboxes are filled with stuff that has nothing to do with their beat, nothing to do with what they cover. If I showed you a screenshot of what one of my colleagues' inboxes looked like with the amount of incoming pitches they would see, you, you would not believe me. You just wouldn't believe me. Reporters are very quick to point out that they're busy. They've got a lot going on. And sometimes that can be eye roll inducing as if like we don't have anything else to do or us PR people are just sitting here twiddling our thumbs. But to translate that, it's they're busy in trying to find news on their beat. They are not just waiting for that pitch to land that's going to, that they're just going to pick and say, yes, I am going to do this story. Um, you know, keep in mind, earned media, that, that earned is the key word there. The only guaranteed coverage that you can have that's going to work out exactly as you want is a paid ad or marketing materials or paid content that you've sponsored. Even if a reporter picks up that press release and says, hey, this is kind of interesting. I want to learn more about this. Uh, you can only control what, what you tell that reporter and the information that that reporter uh, receives and writes about. It's, it, that story may not come out exactly how you want. Not because the reporter is spreading misinformation or doing anything wrong. It's because they're not here to just push out news about your organization and how great it is. They're here to report the news. And that reflects on what their audience needs to hear, what other information they can find out, what other experts say about whatever it is that you're putting out. And again, reporters want news, news that your association is putting out about a new project that you're doing or a new CEO that you have or an event that you're that's coming up. Those are those are wonderful things. Those are things your organization should be doing and they are newsworthy but I'm going to call it news with a small N instead of a capital N because those are news for your organization, for your association. Can you share it with a reporter? Of course you can. There's nothing wrong with sharing that information with a reporter, but you know, 15 responses or, or follow-ups saying, did you get my email? Um, they probably got it. Um, and if they wanted to do something with it, if it contained news, they would have responded to you. Uh, so that's that's kind of the, the nutshell of where where that disconnect can be. And then, of course, how many people have had a leader in their organization or a colleague in their organization that has nothing to do with communications, you know, stroll into your office or send you a slack saying that they've got a great story for The New York Times or The Wall Street Journal. And, you know, let's From page. Let's work yeah, yeah. Let's just let's just get that, you know, just send that email and get that get that in there. So I want to empower you today. Well, one, you know, hear them out, like ask what the story is. What, what is this amazing piece of information that belongs in those top tier, very hard to break through publications and ask them why? Why, why do we need to be in that publication? What is the news about this that warrants that level of coverage? Is that serving our membership? Is that serving our audience? Do our members read the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times? Obviously, they have huge subscription rates and huge audiences, but is that where 
that particular story needs to be because time and money and resources are limited. So, you know, do you need to spend your valuable PR pitching and messaging time, you know, crossing your fingers at the, the pitch works to get into one of those major publications that are dealing with a lot of different things? Or can you send that pitch, but also refocus those efforts on other publications or other earned uh, options that can better serve what the longer term goals are? And you're so right about that, Suzanne. When I first started in PR for an association, I worked really hard and actually got a mention, just a mention in the New York Times. And I was so thrilled. And the group of members that I was representing were annoyed that it was did, was not in the trades and that they were a hundred percent right because the, the trades were where their, their consumers were and not really reading a mention in the New York times. And I, I just feel like that resonates like, yes, you could be trying, you know, to have something placed in a big, a big publication, but is that serving your members? And for me, it was not. For, I want to take a quick second. Um, well, first, congrats on getting that mentioned in the New York Times. For the record, I, I am ha- for the Wall Street Journal and New York Times reporters that are listening. I'm still happy to get that story in there any anytime. Respond to that pitch. But I, I want to talk about the word placed because I think as PR and comms professionals, we use that term a lot, and our higher ups use that a lot uh, to quantify our success. How many stories did you get placed? Um, At the end of the day, which is a cliche that I hate using, but I'm going to use it anyway, the reporters and editors at the news organizations we are pitching decide what gets into the media the next day or, or in that longer term process. They decide what gets in the story. They decide what goes on TV, what goes on their podcast. That is a decision that is left up to them. Sometimes a reporter can think, yeah, this is a really good story. I, I, you know, I want to pursue this. And when they have to do their own internal pitching to their editor and, and however the chain of command works, that story doesn't make it through for whatever reason. And, and now we're not here to debate the news decision making processes of, of all the different outlets. But I think oftentimes when we claim success that a, that our story got placed, it leaves this impression that the reporter somehow did us a favor or, you know, we we somehow worked to get that mention in there and the reporter didn't do anything like that, that. That one magical email just, you know, made it made it through. So I'm not discounting our work uh, when that organization does get mentioned in a story because that's that's the goal. Right. We want that publicity. We want that you know, verification that we are experts at what we do, not only as PR professionals, but for the source or the organization that's getting mentioned. But at the end of the day, again, the reporters make those decisions. I will continue to pitch stories. I will continue to claim success when our organization, (laughs) reporters, you know, gets mentioned somewhere, particularly if it's from something I specifically pitched, or it can be just from the fact that, our stories and the overall company is just seen in more places now through a variety of efforts. But uh, when when claiming success or when talking about uh, how that mentioned is, I just want us to be careful of, you know, that we got it placed. This is not some sort of quid pro quo of, you know, you, I sent you this pitch, you do this favor for me. The news is again, reporters want news and that those news decisions are made by, the media outlets themselves. So if something doesn't get placed, it's not that you failed. It's not that the news wasn't enough. There are a variety of reasons why something on any given day could not get through. And some of this is just luck, the news cycle, what's going on that day. You know, something that you pitched before may have gotten nowhere. And then you try it again a couple months later and you get a phone call back. There, There's a lot of skill and a lot of planning that goes into this, but a lot of what we do is is largely out of our control to a degree. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I I love what you say there about about it being placed and about all the effort that goes into it and and being careful about that language and how you talk about it. And I think that segues nicely into what we wanted to hit on next, which is about not just pitching reporters, but being a resource for them. Um, So I'd love to hear you talk about that and, and how that can help build that relationship. Yeah. So I think, 
you know, PR people and journalists have always had a very interesting relationship. You know, you're not colleagues, you're not friends, but sometimes you can't do your job without the other on, on both sides of that press release or of that information. You know, at Industry Dive, as well as other organizations where I have handled uh, media requests or worked with the media, the one way I have become a resource for reporters is one, just understanding their needs. Deadlines to reporter or deadlines. When a reporter says, I need this information now, they they need that now. Like now is already too late. You know, understanding the speed at which reporters have to work and get information. You know, there are all types of news stories from a breaking news story, from a longer feature, from a deep dive investigation or a really data heavy story. And just understanding the reporter that you want to have include your organization or your expertise in a story about what's their journalism style? What type of stories are they working on? Um, and if you can't help them, tell them that as soon as possible. And if you, and even better, direct them to someone who can, mm -hmm. because it's, it's like the miracle on 34th street when Santa, you know, recommends to go to Gimbel's and uh, people you know, keep shopping at Macy's because they gave them good information on what to do. I'm connected to a lot of people in, in DC and now in the media world. And if, if I can't answer a question, I can definitely send a reporter to someone who, who can. Um, so I think as you're evaluating, again, reporters want news, Think about where your association can be the most helpful. Can you provide members to be experts or quote unquote real people to comment in stories? You know, everything doesn't have to go through your CEO, depending on how your internal communication strategy is laid out and, and what the normal way of working with your leadership is. You know, media training for your members um, and having a pool of people that you can rely on, um, that understand kind of that at, at a moment's notice, you know, you can pass along a cell phone number or pass along an email and they can really uh, provide that insight. That is very valuable to a reporter. Reporters are also always looking for background information and ways to get up to speed on an issue or a topic quickly. So, if, you know, for example, um, I don't work for an association, but I work for a media company. So, we're experts in first party data. We're experts in business journalism. You know, we're experts in uh, digital marketing and content marketing. We're experts in launching new publications. I know that all of, uh, or I know the people within my organization that can speak to those issues. So as I see reporters are covering that, I'll make sure they understand, you know, as they work on future stories or if they're, you know, exploring that topic more to make sure to sort of reach out to me or here are the people within my organization you can you can contact. Topic sheets or tip sheets, fact sheets, things about not just your organization, but the profession or the trade or whatever your organization represents um, and how you can be a resource, resource for them may not lead to that glowing standalone coverage about your organization that some people expect. But again, reporters want news. And when they're chasing down stories, particularly on a deadline, having that background information or knowing uh, you're someone they can count on to get them something in time to make that breaking news deadline or that uh, broadcast show deadline, that'll keep them coming back to you. That's great. I mean, that's, that's really important. Do you have some top tips that you'd like to share with some of the association comms professionals looking to improve their media outreach and their pitching skills? Sure. Um, Industry Dive specializes in understanding our audience. And I think that mantra can be used in so many ways, and particularly with PR professionals. Before you start on an earned media journey, I'll call it, uh, <laughs> you know, really read the publications that you're wanting to get into, you know, using our CEO or, you know, other person example of they want to get into the New York Journal, the New York, ah, the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. What reporter, who do you read in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal? You know, like what section do you want to be in? What, like, you know, pump them from information. Like, who do you want to cover us? Why do you want that particular reporter to cover us? I would also recommend to look at topics that may not be exactly in what your association does, but where reporters might need help 
in that in the area that your organization represents. For for example, NRDC for a little bit, um, and I don't speak for them now, but they worked on some uh, sports arena environmental needs, you know, recycling and climate change issues, things like that. Sports reporters are not environmental reporters, they and they would not normally be on a group of reporters that I would interact with on a regular basis. But for that, uh, you know, I expanded my normal uh, relationships and looked at, you know, who would cover this and not just from a what's the score of last night's baseball game perspective, but who covers more the the business of sports or the planning that goes behind sports. Mm -hmm. So I would recommend sit down with your CEO, your board, um, any decision-making body within your organization and write out the stories that you own. What are the stories or the topics that your organization wants to be known for? And then what news outlets cover that, that story? What, where is the best place to put that story? Also looking at how do, your re, how do your members get information? What publications are they reading? Because the goal of associations getting mentioned in the media is, you know, has a couple of goals. One, raise awareness about your organization. Two, show your members the work and the value you provide to them so they hopefully renew their membership. Three, Hey, donors, we would like your money. Please give us some money. Here's where we have been uh, written about for, you know, all these good reasons. And look, we're in the New York Times. But where are those donors? What are those donors reading? What are your members reading? Um, What are people in your industry reading? Um, And find a way to get that story you want to own. Find the news in it. And then, you know, again, become that resource for reporters. I want to get back to Colleen's original question. How, what are some top tips for pitching? One, I talked about knowing your audience. Know what message you're trying to get across, not only for the audience of your membership. For two, think about the audience of that reporter. Who is that reporter's audience? Who is that reporter writing for? Who reads their publication? You do not need a very expensive software platform to do basic earned media research. Most reporters, not all, but most reporters will have my, my, in my experience, it goes Twitter, LinkedIn, and the publication website. Most reporters, again, not all, will have what they cover, a contact or an email address um, in their Twitter profile, especially if they're trying to build their own audience. Uh, So if you see a reporter in a publication or a news outlet you want to uh, get covered in, I would check Twitter first. Um, and then I would check LinkedIn, see what they cover. Every reporter you pitch, you, you need to. This is not a, an option. You need to look at the last five stories they've written because beats change often, news changes often. Someone who's, who's covering supply chain issues today, and if there's an explosion somewhere, now has to become an expert in oil spills or something. Like beats can shift right. that quickly. So, you know, be cognizant of what that reporter covers. And if you are relying on a software database of a reporter research or reporter beats, definitely double check that against Twitter and the publication, because those last five stories will really give you some insight on what that reporter is covering. Those databases, as much as they try, um, cannot keep up with the fast paced nature of how reporters beats change. And the number yeah. one, we have one, um, I'll just add, we're actually moving away from one I won't name right now, but it, we got to the point where there were so many reporters in our list that weren't relevant that any list, whoever's building it is required to go and look at their, t- for Twitter first and LinkedIn, which I, is, I think it's great that that was the order you gave too, because that's what we found to be best. Look at them both and make sure that, that they're still appropriate for that list. And I would say, 30 to 40%, if not more, were usually incorrect. So, it, you yep. know, you really got to go go to the source. And the number, the number one complaint I hear from my newsroom colleagues, and I also experience, while it's been a while since I've been a reporter, things haven't changed that much. The number one complaint is getting pitches that have nothing, and I mean nothing to do with what <laughs> they cover. My email address is also on the Industry Dive website, of course, because I want reporters to contact me and write great stories about Industry Dive, little plug there. And I get pitches about things 
that they want me to cover. I I, I don't cover anything. I'm not a reporter. <laughs> um, and this isn't like, can you pass this over to your colleagues? It's like, oh, somewhere I am on a list of, you know, I covered something or I know about this. So pitch me. It's like, why, why am I getting, why am I getting this information? So as PR professionals, we have all experienced the, well, how hard can this be? kind of either in, either directly said or inferred from other people within our organization, it can be time consuming to, to generate a solid list of media contacts, of, like of 20 media contacts for a press release that can, that can take, that's 20, that's 20 Twitters to check, 20 links ends to check, you know, 400 something stories to read, you know, to make sure you're right. on the right track. It's time consuming, but that, but that is what makes That is what sets you apart from one of these, I'm just going to throw a thousand emails out and see what happens to an actual strategy and an actual plan of who you're reaching out to and why. And the reporters will notice it. If uh, if there are multiple Twitter accounts of like the bad PR pitch of the day or, you know, the the, the bad PR, like you get dear insert name, you know, dear this and many people will say, you know, I, this, I just have, this has nothing to do with what I cover. And, you know, and if you're covering, if, if one of my um, supply chain reporters or grocery store reporter, that it's pretty clear from her bio, from the last couple stories she's written, from her Twitter account, from LinkedIn, that she covers X, Y, Z issues. And if you keep getting pitches from the same firm or the same organization that are really just not in your wheelhouse. Um, You're just, you're just not going to get an email back when it comes to actually having something that might be relevant for her. So keeping with the mantra of reporters want news, build those relationships, make sure you understand who you're pitching, why you're pitching them and keep in mind that you want to be a resource for them, not just keep responding to the same email over and over again if they got that email or not. Yeah, I love all of that. I think it's so important. And even the ones that seem like common sense, I feel like you just need to hear again and again in this world because you get so busy as a PR person, especially our association PR people. They wear so many hats. So this is incredibly, incredibly helpful and appreciate all your insight. But before we let you go, we have oh, some okay. just fun questions. Okay, fun <laughs> so, questions. Yes. All right. First one's easy. Where did you grow up? So I grew up on the southwest side of Chicago. If it hasn't come through yet, <laughs> if you can't tell if I have an <laughs> accent lingering, um, I grew up in the Brighton Park neighborhood and then near uh, Midway Airport. Nice. I love, I love Chicago. Chicago. <laughs> all right. If you won the lottery tomorrow, would you still work? Um. Yes, to a degree. I, you know, I love industry die, but I don't think I'd be uh, writing press releases and doing outreach, you know, for much longer. I probably would, you know, do training, find, you know, find a charity, you know, do do some really good work um, that I think I have the skill set for. But um, you know, you need funding and, and backing to do that. So I, I would still work, but to a degree, um, and also off of my new yacht or you know some other large <laughs> yes. uh, vacation yeah. style home or resort that I will that, that I will own at that point. <laughs> Love that. That's great. Okay, what's your favorite movie or TV show? Uh, the West Wing has to be said, and. So good. Uh, also fully support the Americans. Uh, if you haven't watched yes. the Americans, you need to. And one of my proud pandemic moments was I have watched every single episode of Law and Order SVU in order through, wow. uh, through the current wow. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> you know, you had to pass the time somehow. And thankfully, it was on many different streaming services. So, uh, uh, you know, Mariska, if you're out there, I'm happy to have coffee with you anytime. <laughs> that's too funny oh my gosh so I credit the West Wing with why I live in the DC area when I was in undergrad I was binging because it was on like reruns twice a day like every morning and I would just watch them before going to classes and I decided I was gonna be a political speech writer and thankfully I had a teacher who said you know that's probably you know not a huge opportunity for a lot of people so you've never really been interested in that before, maybe stick with PR more broadly. And I came to American University for public communication and it worked out perfectly. Josh Lyman forever. That's all I have to say. Yes, absolutely. He was my favorite. (laughs) 
<laughs> awesome. All right. Dogs or cats? Uh, dogs. I have two English bulldogs. So definitely dogs. Aww, nice. All right. And then last question. So I guess some people would say we're out of the pandemic. I'm not sure. It's hard to tell these days, but what's something you missed from the pre-pandemic days? Oh, that's a great question. And I think this was a challenge for a lot of PR professionals, you know, in, in the in, in the very 20, oh, that's so 2019 or early 2020, you know, I would just go to a lot of events at night, whether it was meeting with people casually, you know, meeting with my friends um, or doing a WWPR event or some other type of industry event, a book event or a launch or, you know, living in D.C., there's an association event, you know, living in D.C., there's something going on all the time. And I was just very used to a fast paced schedule of working with the media, you know, networking with the media, just kind of being in that scene. And then it just stopped. I mean, like record scratch stop. And while I still... Um, you know, things are picking back up, but I, I understand hesitancy. And, you know, sometimes it's like, oh, do I really want to go to around that many people? You know, it's, it's still kind of a little bit murky, but I do. And I, and now I work from home, so I don't work downtown anymore. So just kind of like staying in the city. I, I live in the Maryland suburbs. So just staying downtown and meeting with friends and just having that connection to DC proper, um, where now it's like to go into the city is like a, a huge undertaking. Happy to do it. And I do it often, but it's just like, oh my God, I have to leave my house now. Like, what? No, it's, I know you have to plan. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's yes. just that uh, I, I do, I do miss that. However, um, I like virtual events because I think it's, um, you know, just break down, it breaks down barriers a little bit and gives more information to people who may not have the means to travel all the time to a conference or, you know, can, can leave their house you know, or leave their job in the middle of the day. You know, I, the amount of things I've watched on demand later for conferences I couldn't go to or things I couldn't do is just really, really useful. Um, although I am surprised how we went from, did anybody else notice we went right from emails to Zoom, like we skipped phone calls completely. Like, like <laughs> yes. how did we did we forget how the phone works? Like, we went from email and Slack to let's just be on the video call all the time. And it's like, wow, it's you know, just having that that on camera pressure all the time is just a little something yeah. I'm I, I miss having a little more um, anonymity with people yeah. I have to. Interact you know with. what's funny though? I struggle with group phone calls now. Like if I, it's rare to be on one, like you said, because we do zoom, but if there's more than two people on a call, I'm, I'm talking over, or I'm jumping in at the wrong time. And it, I, I like, don't know how to do them anymore. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I think association comms professionals are often underappreciated for the heavy lift and all the work they have to do. But um, at least the three of us understand where they're coming from and the challenges you face. And sometimes when you're the lone person trying to explain to someone how the news cycle works, or, you know, we have, you know, that words matter and punctuation matters or the tone of this matters, um, just know that somewhere else in another office or home office somewhere, there's another PR person having the same conversation. So you're never quite alone in those scenarios, <laughs> even though it can very much sometimes feel like it is. <laughs> yes, that's perfectly said. So on that note, thank you so much for joining us today, Suzanne. I think this was so helpful and, and just awesome, awesome information for our listeners. So we appreciate your time. Great. Thank you. Also thank uh, you. on Twitter and LinkedIn, I have a PR tip of the day that I post pretty frequently. It's not every day, but uh, be sure to check me out and follow there to uh, get a little more insight on the best ways to interact with earned media. Great. Thank awesome. you. Thank you. And that's a wrap on today's episode. Thanks for listening to the Association 100 podcast brought to you by the A100 publishing team powered by Onward and Upward Marketing and Communications. You can subscribe to the Association 100 podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and all of your favorite podcast listening apps so you'll never miss out. Or listen via our website at theassociation100.com. Follow us on Twitter at Association 100. That's Association 100 for all the latest insights and trends impacting the world of associations. Thanks for tuning in.